Could you imagine being a moth keeper? And it'd be like that scene from Ace Ventura where he walks into the apartment and he goes, Aah! and all the animals come out of nowhere, except that's you, and you're like, because you're on a frequency that only moths can hear, and you're just like surrounded by moths? It'd be so great. Welcome back to Nature League. It's the fourth week of the month and that means it is time for a special episode called From A to B. This is where my friend Adrian Adams joins me, Britt Garner, and asks me a question related to the theme we are exploring this month, which is metabolism and aging. I want to hear from you what your question is so we can dig in a little deeper and have some fun with it. Yes, I love moths. I loved them so much. Even before they were memes, I loved moths for like a good chunk of time, I was just like obsessed with moths. I looked into like being a moth keeper because I was lonely and looking for something to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I like looked into it and it turns out that moths, like the really exotic, just beautiful, gorgeous moths live for like three days and then they die. But they're like caterpillars. They're in their larval form for months. You were- Why on earth? It's so stupid. You were so upset when you learned yes! that too. Yes. I mean, no other animal on earth exists that way. Be a ba be in your baby form for ninety percent of your life, and then in your you know adult form for three percent of it. That doesn't make any sense to me. Why? Well, we gotta address a few things to help you get over your heartbreak. Uh. Which, first of all, is uh, talking a little bit more about moths specifically. Yes. Uh, about those life stages. And then secondly, by zooming out a little bit and <sighs> looking at how this might potentially be adaptive and what other species we see it in. So you mentioned like baby form versus adult form. With moths specifically, they have four main life stages. They can be as an egg. They can be as a larva, which is when they are a caterpillar, mm -hmm. right? Then they can be in uh, the form called a pupa, which is actually when they're inside the cocoon. Right. Uh, and then they have the adult form. So when you talk about like baby 90%, and then adult, it, that's not totally fair because they're actually constantly going like across quite a few different life stages, right? Uh, mm, sure, but I feel like that's a, that that's kind of semantics. So, you, so you've just, got like egg, yeah, and then caterpillar form, mm -hmm. pupa, mm -hmm. and then adult. So you're just wondering why you would be larval for a longer amount of time than. Adult well, form. Like, yeah, why wouldn't you be in your, like, that is your apex form. According to what? Dragon Ball Z. Okay. And all anime ever. You haven't even seen my final form. I meant more like according to what factor, like beauty? Because then that is, that's you. You are putting that onto them that that's their best form. They can fly. In what version of any animal anywhere is the ability to fly, like... Probably a lot of them, because we'd really suck at it. Not moths. Moths are great at flying, except when there's electronic lights around. Oh, well, that's fair. Because they use the moon to navigate. Mm -hmm. I know a lot about moths. Then you should know that there's a some something adaptive about staying in a in a non-adult form. You talk about it being it's like elite form, but I think that's just because you think they're prettiest then, and then that everybody thinks they're prettiest then. But when they're pretty, has nothing to do with them surviving or thriving or growing, or reproducing. But why wouldn't they just have a mouth? Why don't the moths have mouths when they're adults? Here's the thing: is that passing on genes doing that thing, there's a lot of arguments to be made very reduction, you know, as a reductionist argument, like everything exists to reproduce, whether it's sexually, asexually, whatever, pass on genes and then you can peace out. But how many times an organism reproduces and how spread out that is actually has different words. And so moths, as well as um, other uh, organisms within their same group, so similar to uh, so butterflies, for example, will do this and it's called semel parity, like S-E-M-E-L, uh, meaning like, uh, like once or you think simultaneous, like that okay. word, you know, like a once and then parity is, is typically talking about reproduction. But in species that have that strategy, after reproducing, they die. And that's actually a programmed death cellularly, which is wild, right? It's not dying of senescence, like old age. Mm -hmm. It is actually a programmed death. So now that you know that, so we have like a larger concept, now I would ask you to think of why would that be advantageous to have a programmed 
death post-reproduction. So you're big and you're colorful and you got scent glands all over you and you're a hot moth to trot hanging out on a tree branch under the moonlight. It's super romantic, but you're also now super vulnerable to predators because you're big and you're colorful and you don't blend into a G darn thing. Mm -hmm. So all you're really good for is attracting another moth to you. You lay your eggs and then you die. So part of that, totally. But but the death itself, what does that then free up for the new individuals? You can't say resources. Is that what you're saying? Resources? Absolutely. Why else would there be a die-off? Baby moths would not be competing for food with adult moths. Besides, they're in their adult form, they are just a giant target for birds, bats. But the fact that they don't even really. have mouths in that adult form is saying like total like non-use of resources. So okay, let's say it's not resources. Let's say in some situation there's actually plenty. It takes energy to reproduce and and to have to go through metamorphosis and to totally break down into goo inside that cocoon and then like reform and all the insanity that happens during that transition. Like there's only X amount of energy. And so I think that there's also something to be said for just using that energy that's been stored up, that which you have remaining, to just go ahead and do the thing and get out of there. I still think it would more have more to do with resources, because otherwise, if it were just a matter of like, you didn't have enough energy for it, then you'd have a mouth so that you could keep renewing energy. I think it might have something to do with density dependence. So we see that there's a lot of things that can happen to populations that depend on density. And density gets too high, there's too many individuals in one location, the mayflies, there's issues. The mayflies in some areas get so bad when they end up mating and then they all just like fall to the ground a couple hours later. Mm. And it can get so thick and so bad that people literally have to like take, like sweep that stuff into the street and then the, the city has to come off and clean up all the dead yeah. mayflies because it's a quarter of an inch thick, just this carpet of dead insects. So that would be a species, a, a similparous species. Well, th th right? th okay, so think about this. I've been thinking of moths as these like one or two little beautiful things or maybe there's a few dozen in an area, but that's not how moths function. We've all seen moths ga gathering, mm -hmm. you know, at like a gas station in the middle of the night in the summer. I mean, it's just everywhere. So I guess if the big moths were reproducing at that number and didn't die off to make way for the next wave, there would just be way too many. Yeah, and... and Even if that sounds like heaven to me, doesn't have to to you, but sounds like heaven to me. Way too many moths. Heaven. Too many moths? Yeah, and it doesn't just have to be resources like food. Resources can also be things like uh, water, it can be space, it can be density dependence, things like uh, disease, so mm. having certain densities. So there is some form of, of advantage that might come from clearing out of the way, making way for the new. Otherwise, I feel like we wouldn't see an adult without a mouth, <laughs> right? Only alive for a few days. I'm really sorry, saying it out loud, like I see your heart breaking. <laughs> There's a few animals that I wanna meet before I die. I wanna meet like a big old like atlas moth. I wanna meet a platypus. I wanna meet a North American opossum. I wanna meet an armadillo. I'm sad. <laughs> Let me be sad. Let me lament. You know, what's even stranger though is thinking about mammals that are similparous. There are some there's smaller... mammals that do that? Yeah. Like what? That's wild, right? What? Some small, there's like smaller mammals, I think in Australia. So if we see, if we see simul, uh, simul parity in like mammals and fish and insects, it, you know, it, clearly there's something if we see it across several different taxa or groups. Yeah. That's advantageous. So maybe you just start need to appreciate in caterpillars and then you can enjoy that life stage. There's the fuzzy caterpillars. They're really cool. I can put them on my lip as a mustache. Sure could. You have a mustache. Why would you add a mustache? It's the cooler mustache. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this <laughs> month's episode of From A to B. Thank you, Adrian, for joining me. And I hope that you maybe feel a little bit better about your mods. We at least have a name for the phenomenon. I don't know, maybe we can appreciate the other little life stages. Appreciate the eggs that can now grow up because that adult moth is gone. Maybe.
I'm here I'd for you. I'd trade a thousand moth eggs for one adult moth that lived like, you know, a year. Thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. And we will see you next week for a brand new month and a brand new theme. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.